Ready? Here we go. Given that I am a human being and a passionate, committed tester, when people talk about agile software development and reduce it to a bunch of formulaic keywords and reduce testing to algorithmic checking and reduce qualifications to multiple choice questionnaires and dismiss deep, skilled, rich, inexpensive, fast testing and don't help to make life better for people, then I get upset and I have too much to talk about in only one hour. So. Uh, I thought maybe I would begin with uh, some question and answers based on questions that I've been hearing around the last, around here the last couple of days. Uh, so let's start with just a basic Q&A, it's the easiest way to go about it. And then maybe actually we could play a game of risk. I have 105 slides. I have uh, less than an hour in which to deliver my talk. And um, the other thing I want to try to make clear is uh, at... Um, Exactly 10.30, Alex Bodin. Where's Alex? You hear Alex? There he is. Stand up, man. He's going to give a two-hour workshop, and I want to be at that workshop. So um, I have even less than uh, uh, an hour, and I want to open the floor to questions at a certain point. So let's, um, let's start here. I'm a manual tester. How do I fit in on an Agile team? My answer is that testing is neither manual nor automated. Nobody goes to a manual doctor. Parents aren't manual parents. Nobody does manual research, and nobody does manual management either. You're not a manual tester. You're a tester. He's not a manual programmer. She's not a manual product owner. That's not a manual researcher over there. Nobody does manual parenting. You're a tester. You're a tester. Don't say you're a manual tester, an automated tester. Oh, that's not what I mean. What I mean is I'm not a programmer. How do I fit in? Because they want me to automate the test cases. Ah! Testing is not test cases. Testing is not about test cases. Nobody does... Pi Alex, do you do piloting cases? You do not do piloting cases. Nobody does parenting cases or research cases or management cases. Testing is not about test cases. And here's why I, this, I get upset about this. Because testing is about exploration. It's about investigation. It's about experimentation. It's about learning things on behalf of our clients. It is about evaluating the product by learning about it. It's not about cases. Framing stuff as cases is no way to think about a learning project. Test cases focus on output checking. They focus on confirming that something works. But we can't confirm that something works. We can only confirm that it did work or that it seems to work or that it feeds back. Test cases are about demonstrating that a product works. And there's a problem, too, that when people start talking about test cases as units of testing production, they start counting them. And when people start turning testing and evaluation of a product and evaluation of testing itself into counting rather than into assessment, we start losing information. We, we lose our ability to learn stuff, and things get all messed up. So, how do I do Agile testing? Well, I'm going to offer the, con the controversial uh, point of view that uh, uh, there is not Agile testing. There is testing in Agile contexts. There is testing responding to the context that an Agile software development project uh, uh, entails. But testing is testing. Testing is always testing, and Agile is context. In the beginning, in the beginning was the universal development cycle in which we discover something worth building and then we build some of it and we build it virtuously. We build it virtuously and then we study what we built in order to discover uh, what we should build next or what we should fix next perhaps. So in the traditional development cycle, which was actually not traditional at all, this development cycle started to emerge in the 1970s and 80s as the process enthusiasts and the formalists started to take control of software development. Instead of building some of it, we built almost all of it. 
And that's not the way software development used to work. Back in the 1950s and 60s, when people were, early 50s and, 50, uh, and 60s, when people were working with software, they did not try to do too much all at once. And they relentlessly studied things as they built them. Getting it right the first time was a version of virtue, uh, according to the formalist. Make sure we get stuff right the first time, because computer time is expensive, and uh, development cycles are long. And then, when we study what we built, we find, ah, because we, we're not testing it all the way along, there's lots of bugs and lots of problems that we discover late in the project. And so, after the first long loop of product development, there's a bunch of really short, panicky loops while we try to fix all the problems that we uh, buried in the product as we were building it long and slow during this ponderous process. Plus, along the way came this notion of testing as, a, as an assembly line. And uh, uh, recently, uh, there's all this uh, uh, stuff they recently pushed through ISO standard 29119 after seven years of development. They introduced this thing in 2015. After seven years of development, this looks exactly the same as it did the first year they developed, which indicates no development actually happened. So brought to you by the certificationists, the same people who are responsible for tester certification and collecting a hundred million dollars of your money, think about it, 500,000 testers certified, $200 a piece, roughly speaking, United States uh, dollars, a hundred million dollars have gone to the certificationists, where's it gone? I didn't think you had an answer either. No loops, no loops in this process, a straight assembly line process for uh, 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 doing test planning. It's ridiculous. At the end of it, it comes out as a test planning document, something we publish. But that's not what test planning is. Test planning is gathering sets of ideas that guide our choices and our activities during our test project. It's a set of ideas. It's not a document. Then, sometime in the late 1990s and the early 2000s, along came agile software development. Hooray! And what did it look like? They said, we're uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others to do it. Uh, uncovering is actually right, because those things had been existing, it had been in existence 30 years ago in the 1950s and 60s. What uh, uh, Jerry Weinberg reports is what he was doing uh, with his colleagues when there were only 150 computer programmers in the world, looked very much like agile software development as the Agilists proposed it. Uh, in uh, 2000, 2001, when the uh, uh, Agile Manifesto for Agile Software Development was put out. Through this work, we've come to, come to value individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation and responding to change over following a plan. And then they said, this is really important, while there is value in the things on the right, we value the items on the left more. And that's really key. They didn't mean no documentation. They didn't mean no processes and tools. They didn't mean no contract negotiation. They didn't mean no following a plan. What they did was they wanted to decenter those things. They wanted to take those things away from the center of project development and put the things on the left back into the center where they ought to be. Then they established some principles customer satisfaction, welcoming changing requirements, not trying to resist them, developing working software frequently and delivering it frequently, working together daily, testers and developers and, and, and business people all working together daily throughout the project, the idea of the motivated individual being at the center of development, an environment that's supporting and uh, offers trust, conversation, over mediated uh, uh, forms of connecting with people. Working software is the primary measure of, pro of progress, they said. Sustainable development, an idea that disappeared uh, uh, remarkably early on in the um, uh, talk about Agile. Craftsmanship, uh, uh, craftspeople working together, uh, uh, people working to develop their craft. Attention to technical excellence. Simplicity, not building too much and not building things that are too big, and trying to reduce the amount of uh, work 
uh, uh, being done and, and uh, increasing the amount of work not being done so that we can focus on the work that's actually being done. The best architectures, requirements, and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. <laughs> Sometimes people ask me, how should we self-organize our self-organizing team? Organize it yourself. Tuning and adjusting our behavior by regular review and regular retrospection, looking back on what we've done and saying, how do we do? So, the big change that agile software development made to the traditional model, quote, traditional model of software development was two things. First of all, let's shorten the development cycles and not try to do something too big, too huge. And let's, instead of building some of it, being building almost all of it, let's build almost none of it. And build it virtuously turns from get it right the first time into build with change in mind, because the one constant that we face in our world is change. We're always dealing with changing requirements, changing priorities, changing technologies, changing teams, changing people, changing what we know. That's always changing. So we recognize that we'll make mistakes, we recognize that we'll get new information, and we build the product with change in mind. That makes it much easier to study what we built so that we can discover problems and fix them right away, and lots of short loops where we're uh, uh, performing incremental improvements to the product and, and uh, uh, speeding things up that way so we don't get too ahead of ourselves, so bugs don't get buried deep in the product. So little short bursts of activity. James Bach and I, uh, a few years ago, got a cranky. <laughs> upset about uh, uh, the uh, Agile testing quadrants. Uh, we thought that they were not really very helpful from our perspective, and so we decided to make some quadrants of our own. Part of that process involved trying to figure out what it actually meant to do Agile development and how that would interact with testing. So the principles that we took from what we knew about Agile development, our own experience in working with Agile groups, uh, what we were hearing from the field, uh, from uh, testers working in Agile contexts, the principles on which Agile uh, uh, software development was declared, we, we figured that these were about the, uh, uh, the seven most important things. Delivering often, collaboration across roles, focusing, focusing on uh, what they call craftsmanship, these days we might call it craft, or craft people chip to make sure that we recognize uh, the problems that we've got with uh, uh, traditional forms of language and how they tend to exclude about half the population. So there's a bug in my slide to be fixed. Trying to avoid excessive formality, being prepared to uh, learn things by experience and by, by trying things out, by exploring things and experimenting with them, by learning to build and use tools expertly, and most importantly, by seeking a sustainable pace. One of the things I keep hearing from testers is, I'm on an agile team and I'm overwhelmed with work. Well, that's part of your report, isn't it? I don't know how to do all the testing work I need to do without some help from the team. And uh, the team doesn't know how to build all this stuff without some help from the business. We need to pace our work so that we're not being overwhelmed by the amount of work to be done. So. Everything was looking great. I was uh, uh, really, I, was, I loved Agile software development. Joined the Agile testing mailing list in 2003, and uh, I got upset pretty quickly. Uh, and I stayed upset for five years, and then in 2008, I dropped off the Agile testing mailing list because I was just so discouraged. You know, individuals and interactions over processes and tools, and all I was seeing on that forum was, what are the best tools we can use to implement our Agile process? <laughs> It was heartbreaking. A really big problem with Agile software development, it seemed to me, was that Agile's earliest roots were in XP, extreme programming, which is great. At extreme programming is amazing, it's wonderful, I think it's terrific, but it is focused on programmers. And so early talk about Agile came to be dominated by talk about programmer stuff. Programmer testing. Functional correctness, definition of done, and testing became confused with output checking. 
And the problem with that is there can be many, many more problems in the relationships between people and product than just simple output checking might reveal. There's a story about risk. And you know, it's uh, one of the things that James and I uh, uh, encounter a lot is that we tend to have in the world of testing some fairly um, uh, shallow summaries of things and shallow uh, um, uh, looks at things. So we were given a mandate by Jerry Weinberg at one point. Jerry encouraged us to go deeper. So here's, here's going deep. You know, ask, ask somebody what a, a risk is, and they'll tell you, well, uh, something bad might happen. Something bad might happen. Well, let's unpack that. Let's unpack that. Some person or persons, like a user, a customer, a developer, a tester, a business person, a bystander, a group, a company, an organization, or society at large, will experience, that is to say, they'll be affected by, uh, uh, in some particular context, some event, some situation, at least once by a problem. A problem that leads to bad feelings, that leads to annoyance or frustration or confusion or surprise or uh, irritation or impatience or to loss, or harm, or diminished value, or death, with respect to something desirable like life, or capability, or reliability, or performance, that can be detected. It can be detected by feelings, it can be detected by tools, it can be detected by comparison to artifacts in some set of conditions, not always, Maybe not necessarily always, maybe only sometimes, maybe occasionally, maybe intermittently, because of a vulnerability like a bug or a missing feature or an inconsistency in the system, some result or process or component or feature or requirement. And when we unpack all that stuff, we start to see a rich model of things that we could examine when we're, when we're testing, that we could explore when we're testing, that we can assess when we're testing. So what would testing look like in an agile context. Individuals and interactions over processes and tools? Well, if that's true, if that's a, a something that we value, then we would value the focus on the skill set and the mindset of the individual tester. We would eliminate wasteful documentation if we're thinking about working software over comprehensive documentation. And we would emphasize discovery, experimentation, exploration, and learning. Instead of contract negotiation, we would value collaborating with the customer, with the clients of testing, with the stakeholders of the product uh, that is uh, being affected. And by responding to change over following a plan, we would respond rapidly to the ever-changing missions of testing. There's another bug, because testing can have many missions. So what does that look like pasted onto our diagram of the Agile development cycle? Well, if we want to discover something worth building, we want to focus on the high value of the product. And if we want to build a change in mind, uh, our reason for doing that is to, to try to make the cost of development and the cost of change low. What does that mean? It means that there's a building mindset as we're building with change in mind, and as we're studying what we built, there's a testing mindset. At the beginning of the project, we're envisioning success. And as we start to build a project and build, take it down into little pieces, we're focusing on the, the, the small and the little bits of it, the units. And then we anticipate failure as we uh, uh, begin to move from building with change in mind to studying what we built. And that involves us defocusing and looking at the bigger picture that we see in the testing mindset. So in agile testing, Testing in an Agile context, testing is woven into development. We discover something worth building, and as we do so, we develop the design. And in that, we do testing that helps to build the vision of the product. We develop the design so that we can build some of it. And as we build some of it, we perform output checking and review that helps us to avoid little problems before they get buried into big problems. So we build cleanly and simply so that we can build cha with change in mind. And as we're building the change in mind, we foster testability so that we can prepare for a test process that allows 
development to go quickly and so that it, it enables us to study what we built. And as we study what we built, we, we uh, experiment imaginatively and suspiciously. Imaginatively. Developing a deep imagination of how people could use the product and how things could go wrong. And suspiciously, because we're always looking for problems, we're always looking for problems in the product and in the relationship between the product and the people who are going to be interacting with it and using it, so that we can discover something worth building and go around the cycle again nice and rapidly. Rapidly! Which leads us to rapid software testing. And that's how rapid software testing, testing fits in with Agile very nicely. It comes from the same roots as Agile software development. The same kind of issues, realizing that there was a different way to develop software than the big ponderous stuff that the formalists had developed uh, through the, the 1970s and 1980s and 1990s. A skill set and a mindset focused on doing the fastest, least expensive we can do expensive testing that we can do that still completely fulfills the mission of testing. And the mission of testing is to evaluate the product by learning about it. That's what the, our fundamental belief about what testing is. Our premises are surrounded around the idea that software projects and products are relationships between people. And people are funny. Uh, a product manager will uh, ask you for uh, a, a a test plan that he never reads. Uh, customers will ask for features that they never use. A developer might reject uh, uh, your bugs because she doesn't like you very much. So people are creatures of both rationality and emotion. And we've got to take that into account as we're developing products and uh, uh, projects. Every project occurs under conditions of uncertainty and time pressure. Why? Because of economics and ambition. People want to get a problem solved, and they want to get it solved quickly, and they want to solve it first, because if they don't do that, we're all going to end up working for the competition if we're lucky enough to have jobs at all. And because of that, despite our best intentions, despite our best hopes, some degree of naivety, of carelessness, of incompetence is normal. I'm not saying it's desirable, but it's normal for people to mess up. It's normal for people to make mistakes. And therefore, it's important for us as uh, testers uh, to be two things, to be diligent about focusing on finding problems and to be compassionate. What's the default emotional stance for a tester? Jerry Weinberg offers empathy, compassion. Because people do make mistakes, just like we do. And if they're going to be making mistakes, it's our painful and socially disruptive job to help them realize what those mistakes are so that those mistakes don't make their way to customers. Apropos of all that, a test is a performance. It's not about artifacts. It's not about use cases. It's not about test scripts. A test is a performance. It's interacting with the product and learning about it. Now, because of those first three things especially, software projects are fraught with risk, and it's our job to investigate risk. That's what we do as testers. We investigate the possibility of a bad thing happening, some person being affected by a problem in the product that could hurt them. Testing's purpose is to discover the status of the product and anything that threatens its value so our clients can make informed decisions about what to do next. It's our job as testers to commit to performing credible, cost-effective testing and to, ooh, that's a weird typo. Look at that, commitment. I must have been typing something very strange at that point. There we go better. Fixed in production. Um, oh, oh you, of course, you didn't get to see that because uh, that was on the wrong screen. Let's say, uh, well, that's good. Let's, yeah, great. All right. So it's our uh, um, a mission to discover the status of the product and threats to its value. We commit to performing the fastest, least expensive we can do, and we inform our clients about anything that threatens that. We commit to not knowingly or negligently misleading our clients or ourselves. And we uh, accept responsibility for the quality of the testing work, but we cannot control the pro quality of the product. How many people here have the title quality assurance? Put your hands up if you have that title, quality assurance. OK, you quality assurance people, answer me this. Do you change the code in the product, the, the production code? Yes, no? No. OK, do you control the schedule of the project such that if it's uh, looking really good, you can ship it early? 
No. All right. Do you control the budget? No. Do you have hiring and firing authority over the programmers? You can't hire and fire the programmers, can you? No. Okay. Uh, do you have uh, control over the contractual relationships with customers? No. Okay. So how exactly do you assure quality? We don't assure quality. We explore quality. We assess quality. We assist quality. QA stands for quality awareness, or maybe questions answered, but we don't control the quality of the product. We're not the gatekeepers. So based on those premises, the idea that we have a practical focus, a duty of care, we have a scope of responsibility that is limited, rapid software testing focuses on a bunch of different things. A social approach to testing. We listen to and respond to context. We focus on developing ourselves as testers, and we take responsibility for our, the quality of our work, but not for the quality of the product. We respect both explicit and tacit knowledge, the things that we know but that we do not say, that have not been written down, that have not been spoken. We focus very strongly on what we're here for. We learn and we come to know what we're here to do. We develop our identities as testers that way. We reject waste. We reject misleading people. We need variety and diversity to cover complex products. So we need to diversify our testing and our approaches to testing. We work with ever-changing connections between people and products. And we recognize that our approaches to testing have to be rooted in heuristics, fallible ways of solving problems, ways of solving problems that work but they might fail. We develop our abilities on the job and by study. We focus on exploration in rapid software testing. Everything evolves. We don't have the right answers today. Everything evolves over time. We not only learn about the product, we learn how to test the product as we're testing it. We focus on product risk. And Unlike anything you'll see in any of these uh, silly certification schemes, we recognize the significance of feelings. Feelings are like the early warning system for problems. Feelings are how we get to recognize problems, how we find out about problems. Every time I found a bug, every time I found a bug, the finding of the bug, the recognition of the bug, for me always begins with a feeling, a feeling of surprise or impatience or annoyance or confusion irritation, frustration. Our feelings are super important. And one of the awful things I see in software development these days is that we dismiss our feelings. We put those feelings aside. People say there's, there's no place for feelings in software development. And you say, really? I think there is. And they always say, there's no place for feelings in software development, which is fascinating because that's a feeling about a feeling, isn't it? So we do use our feelings, but we think critically about them. The biggest deal for us, testing, actual tests, not test cases, not checks, actual tests, performing and designing experiments, actual testing, interacting with the product and learning about it. What about management? In rapid software testing, management is focused on activities, not on artifacts. We don't count test cases. And instead of uh, thinking about uh, 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 measurements or metrics, we think much more about assessment. Metrics is a, uh, a metric is a mathematical function, the way you hang a number off an observation. If you're going to study metrics, the very least you could do is study measurement theory. Please do that. And look at how uh, a human evaluation is done. Human evaluation is not uh, done by performance metrics. Uh, um, if, they, if they want to read a book about it, read uh, Measuring and Managing Performance in Organizations by Robert Austin, if you want to talk about metrics. Automation. We use tools, but we don't talk about automated testing. We don't talk about test automation because it's confusing. As soon as we start talking about test automation, people start thinking that testing can be automated. But testing can no more be automated than development can be automated. Testing is part of development. There is a part of testing that can be automated. We call that checking, and we'll get to that in a sec. Testers have to report and explain. Our documentation should be concise, compact, limited. Conversation's a good way of getting communication happening. 
and our speech should be precise. Of all people, it seems to me that the testers on the project, whose job it is to avoid confusion, whose job it is to avoid misunderstanding, of all people, our speech should be precise. All of these points are way consistent with the manifesto for agile software development. That's our goal. Now, is this agile testing? To verify power accuracy, step A, step B, step C, step D, step E, step F, step G. Is that testing? That doesn't look like testing to me. It looks like a procedure. It looks like something algorithmic. And it doesn't, I don't see any risk anywhere here. I don't see any motivation anywhere here. I just see a list of instructions. What about this? Is this agile testing? Given that the components are turned on according to the connection sediment and the zapper box is on and the control box is on, when I set the default setting and I select the na uh, nominal duration and nominal power setting and I press the start button, then the zapper should report the power setting 10% of minus on the display. This is not testing. This is not testing. This is simply requirements documentation. It's not a test. It's an example, perhaps, but it's not a test. That's an example of precise speech. Let us not call this a test. This is not a test. It's not an acceptance test. In fact, if the product doesn't do that, we should be rejecting the product. So it's a check, <laughs> and it's a rejection check at that. What about this? Is this agile testing? Here's a cartoon character from my youth, George Jetson. According to Wikipedia, uh, the Wikipedia biography of George Jetson, he's an employee at Spacely Space Prockets, and his job title is Digital Index Operator. His job is to repeatedly press a button, push a single button, or one of a series of buttons sometimes, on a computer. In one of the episodes, George complained of his heavy workload, having to push a button for one hour, two days a week. Is that what agile testing is all about? New. No. It is not. Let me explain what I mean. Let's call this checking, not testing. Checking, in the rapid software testing namespace, is operating a product algorithmically to check specific facts about it. Operating and observing the product, interacting with it in specific and algorithmic ways to, lex to collect specific observations, and then evaluating it in the weak sense of evaluation. In the weak sense of evaluation, the same way we would talk about uh, uh, evaluating two and then plus and then two and evaluating that as four. And then applying algorithmic decision rules to those observations. And then reporting algorithmically the output of those decision rules. Is there a key word here, do you think, that I might be focusing on? You know, if you're paying attention, you might see a word that I'm repeating over and over and over again, algorithmic. Think like spelling checker. That's how we think. Or think of compiler checking. This is a part of testing that can indeed be automated. But it's not testing. It's not testing because testing is so much more than that. A check can be performed by a machine that can't think but that has the virtue of being very fast and very precise. A check can also be performed by a sufficiently disengaged human being, a human being who's been told not to think, keep the thinking down part. But notice when I'm mentioning quick and I'm mentioning slow, what I'm referring to here is the speed of observable behaviors, not the intention. And intention is what's key to testing. The machine is infinitely slow at that. Machines don't understand intention. They don't understand motivation. They don't understand the why. That's our job. That's our job. Testing is far more than checking. Checking's fine, it's okay, it's a good thing, but it's fo mostly focused on confirmation of things that we already know or hope or believe to be true. And if we're gonna understand our products, and if we're gonna understand the risk associated with problems that matter to people. We have to do more than output checking. We have to test. So what is testing? 
Well, testing includes operating a product algorithmically to check specific facts about it. That's something we can do while we're testing. But testing is so much more than that. Testing is evaluating a product by learning about it through exploration and experimentation. And that includes, to some degree, questioning, studying, modeling, making inferences, making conjectures, collaborating with other people, generating ideas, elaborating on ideas that we've generated, refining ideas that we've elaborated on, overproducing ideas, abandoning over, uh, ideas that we've overproduced, recovering ideas that we've abandoned. It involves navigating and map making. It involves recording and reporting. It involves developing tools and choosing tools and negotiating our mission, all kinds of stuff that is far more than output checking. And what disturbs me about agile software development as it's being practiced these days is this fascination with output checking. I think it's kind of a case of programmer envy in a way. Oh, look, we can use machines too. But you know, when we think about it, testing is even more than that. Testing is creating the conditions necessary for evaluating a product by learning about it through exploration and experimentation so that we can help our clients make informed decisions about risks. But of course, testing is even more than that. It's about acquiring the skill, the reputation, the desire, the inclination for creating the conditions necessary to evaluate a product by learning about it through exploration and experimentation, which, by the way, might happen to include operating a product algorithmically to check specific facts about it. Why is it important to distinguish between testing and checking? Because checking is mechanistic. It can be made completely explicit. It can be automated, but it's inside testing. It's a tactic of testing. Nobody confuses biting and eating. Your mother never said to you, you won't grow if you don't bite. No doctor or nutritionist ever told you that, that good biting is part of a, a healthy lifestyle. Nobody says, geez, I didn't have breakfast this morning. I'm going to have to bite something pretty soon. Biting can be automated. We can use machines for automated biting. Or, you know, maybe more primitive forms of that. But people don't confuse biting and eating. Biting can be done by tools. Eating can't. That's exactly what we're talking about when we're talking about testing and checking. Oh, here, here's another example of that. Programming can't be automated. Compiling can be automated. But just because we had compilers, nobody started worrying that we would get rid of programmers anytime soon. And testers, we should be the same way. Nobody should worry about artificial intelligence, which is a marketing term, you think in terms of artificial Christmas tree or artificial sweetener or artificial turf. Nobody should be worried about artificial intelligence replacing us anytime soon. Artificial intelligence is merely quite sophisticated software. It's a metaphor. Machines don't learn. Machines perform st uh, help us to perform statistical analysis. Notice how I even had to catch myself. Machines help us to perform statistical analysis. Machines don't do statistical analysis. Machines are tools. They're not going to replace us anytime soon. It's important to distinguish between testing and checking because testing involves tacit knowledge, social skills that can't be put into code. And testing skills have to be developed through socialization, through collaboration, through practice through interaction with people, not via procedures. The test is not the script. The test is what you think and what you do. And that's important because when we're talking about the efficiency of testing or the effectiveness of testing, there's very different conversations when we're talking about explicit versus tacit skills. And because for testing to be really good, if we want to do really good testing and we want to do really good checking, checking has to be embedded inside excellent testing. Investigation of risk. Developing valuable checks requires testing skill and programming skill. And programmers have resisted this kind of problem forever and ever. For a little while, compilers are called autocoders. Programmers put a stop to that pretty quickly. All right. So you're in a tester. You're embedded in an agile team. What are you supposed to do at those team meetings? Learn. 
Advocate for testability. Challenge assumptions. Establish your role as a tester. Ask questions. That, that's what happens during that meeting when we're developing the design of the project. Interacting with diverse users. Thinking of rich example. Bringing in information from outside. Bringing in reports from the field. Helping people to refine user stories. That's what we do. Asking questions. So what kind of questions should we ask? What are we building? Who are we building it for? What could go wrong and how would we know? If we want to be valuable in a project, let us focus on problems and risk. Building cleanly and simply, what do we do in that position as uh, 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 testers? Mostly what I think we should do as testers is we should try to stay out of the developer's hair. <laughs> now, what we could do is offer help. We can offer help, ask how we can help the developers, but don't inflict help on them. Don't barge in. Don't presume to be the developer. Participate in the process. If we're invited, offer to test anything they give us right away and offer to help with investigating mysteries, with setting things up, but being a service to the project and not a bottleneck and not a busybody, I think that's the best way for us to contribute at that point. But to make it explicit, make it absolutely clear that we are here to test. We are here to look for problems in anything that the developers give us right here, right now. Fostering testability, to get explicit about that, we prepare test environments and tools. We make the product easy to test. We identify and explore risk. We try to minimize problems and trouble when the product is changing. We try to get rid of obstacles and distractions to testing. And that involves strong collaboration between testers and developers at that point. That's when we, the programmers have raised their heads from actually coding and we participate with the developers in that space in between building the product and studying what we built, which would be a very narrow, very short space indeed. As testers, a lot of people say, have we achieved our definition of done? I, do, I worry about that as a tester. I want to talk about how we might not be done yet. Because our definition of done, which was set at the beginning of the sprint, was done at the very time in the sprint when we knew the least about what would happen during the sprint. We've got to go way beyond the given when then and model in many diverse ways. It's our job to challenge the product not to go along with a bunch of canned examples. And it's our job to test and check against risk, remain focused on risk. Investigating mysteries, helping the developers to find out what's going on, and telling compelling stories about bugs. So that brings us to the expanded version of our Agile testing quadrants. So where shall I go next? Given our limited time together, and given the fact that I really want to go see Alex's talk, and uh, given the fact that you probably have a bunch of questions. All right, let's do these things. Let's go here. I'm not a programmer. I'm on an Agile team. They say I have to program. How do I fit in? There are two ways you can do it. You can learn to code, or you can learn to be charming. Because af after all, developing a product and testing it is a goal that we all share. And there are people on the project who are really good at programming. We call them programmers. So as a tester, I've developed programming skill. Uh, and as a programmer, I've worked as a programmer for a while. I, I liked testing more. Uh, learn to program. It, it's not that hard. But if you really hate the idea, that's OK. You can exercise your social skills instead of your programming skills. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. It takes diverse talents to, to uh, uh, build and to test a product. And that diversity of talents means that some people don't have to be programmers. Remember that your role as a tester is to test. Now, the next question that follows from a lot of people is, but there's supposed to be no roles on an Agile team. <sighs> what a dumb idea that there should be no roles. Why not just eliminate roles? Eh, why not eliminate roles? I'll tell you why. Because if you eliminate roles, certain kind of work 
is not going to get done. People think about roles as prisons or fortresses. Why? I think it's because when you define a role as the only things you do, or define a role as things only you do and no one else does, then a role turns into something kind of impractical. It develops high social distance. It keeps people isolated from each other, not just in a silo, but in a prison or a fortress. Here's what a role is, we believe. A role is a commitment to get a certain kind of work done, to perform some kind of service. A role is an idea to focus that commitment in a way to help people organize that commitment to get stuff done. It's a heuristic for explaining or defining the work that we do on which we're focused, like a hat that we wear. Alex, I believe, I think you telegraphed, didn't you tell me that you're going to have two hats in your talk? Two hats. How can you have two hats at once? It looks a little silly to wear two hats at once, but you can take a hat off and you can put it on really quickly. It's easy to do, but it's hard to wear two hats at once and not look silly. You can switch rapidly between hats. The problem comes, it seems to me, when people think of what a, a role is, a declaration of the only thing that you do are things that only you're allowed to do, or thinking of a role as permanent or unchanging. That's not what a role is. A role is not like a tattoo. Tattoo. A role is like, not a, a fortress or a prison or a silo, a role is like a villa. It's a place into which we welcome other people to enjoy our place. We take responsibility for cleaning up. We take responsibility for maintaining it. Uh, we get to go to other people's villas from time to time. So developers help testers, and testers help developers, but testers are responsible and accountable for testing. Flexible social distance. Uh, uh, some people say, well, this would be all right. We just get developers to do all the testing. Have you ever seen a developer getting a bug report from the field? They go practically out of their mind. I'm willing to take on that job. That's my commitment as a tester. I'm willing to uh, figure out and interpret this report that I'm getting from somebody out in the field. I'm willing to do that. That's a job I take on. That's the thing I do in my villa so that I can get a nice, crisp, reproducible instance of the problem for the developer to focus on, pinpoint the problem, and fix it. That's the service that I offer. What's unique about us? We test more reliably and more deeply. You know, when you think about it, shallow testing's easy. There's the buried treasure. The buried treasure's on the top. But the problem is, the deep, the, those are sharks, by the way. Uh, the deep testing is difficult with all those sharks swarming down below there. In the shallow waters, finding easy problems is easy. But as a tester, we aspire to doing that testing. We like the challenge of that. We like going down and swimming with the sharks so we can find the, the uh, uh, bugs buried deeply at the bottom of the deep, deep, deep ocean of uh, complexity. So there doesn't have to be somebody called tester on an Agile team. Doesn't have to be somebody called that. But if there is going to be a complex or a challenging or a risky product, then we better have people in a testing role from time to time ready to tell the testing story. Why? What is it the managers want from testers? They want an answer to this question. Are there problems that threaten the on-time successful completion of the project? That's what I'm focused on. Not building the product. Other people are building the product. Not quality assurance. Other people assure the quality of the product. I investigate it. I explore it. I want to know, are there problems that threaten the on-time successful completion of the project? Because that's what my client wants to know. And in order to do that, I have two questions in mind. One is, as I'm looking at the product, I'm thinking, is there a problem here? Is there a problem here? Is there a problem here? I'm trying, I'm exploring the product, I'm investigating, I'm playing with it. I'm asking myself, is there a problem here? But I'm also imagining my client up over my shoulder, watching what I'm doing and seeing me banging into obstacles, things that slow me down or make testing harder. And I'm asking my client, are you okay with this? That's what I'm asking my client. I'm asking my client, are you okay with all this? 
Because if testing is harder or slower, bugs will survive for longer. So when I need help, what I ask my client is, are you okay? Because, you know, if they're okay with it, I'm perfectly prepared to deal with those obstacles and to tolerate them. Except, when my client comes to me six months from now, I want to make sure when they ask, why didn't you find that bug? That they had their answer today. That I was reporting on those problems and obstacles. So, as testers, we must tell the story of testing. And it's a three-part story, braided like this. First of all, We've got to tell a story about the status of the product, as Rick mentioned. What it is, what it does, how it works, how it doesn't work, how it might not work in ways that matter to our various clients. We also have to store, uh, tell a story about how we tested to get that product story. What we did to set the product up, to observe it, to evaluate it, to investigate it. And what we have covered and what we have not covered yet we're not covered at all, because that's where the risk lives. It lives in the parts of the product that are uncovered. And we also need to tell a story about the quality of the testing, how good our testing was, or how good it could be, what got in the way of testing, what made things harder or slower, what's making testing more difficult for us. Now, in order to do that, we need a rich model of testing. So I'm going to do a fast demo of something that you can do too. We've invented testing for ourselves. Every tester needs a personal model of testing. You can adopt ours if you like, that'd be okay, but you have to own it. You have to internalize it. So without looking, without watching, I'm going to tell you how I do testing on a project. Here's what I do. The first thing I have to do is I have to think about the context. I have to think about the project environment. So I have to think about my mission. I have to think about the information that's available to me and the information that I have to find. I have to think about my relationship with the developers. I have to think about my relationship with the test team and who they are and what the skills are and what we need. Uh, I need to uh, consider my environment and my equipment and tools. I need to consider the schedule. I need to consider the item that I'm going to test. I'll get to that in a sec. And I need to consider the deliverables that I'm going to deliver to my client. In order to comprehend the product, I think need to think about the product in terms of its structure, the bits and pieces of it, the functions it performs, the data that it operates on and, and outputs. I need to think about the interfaces by which we get data into and out of the product and by which we can monitor the product. I need to think about the platforms upon which the product runs and what it depends on. I need to think about operations, people actually, the way people actually use the product when the rubber meets the road. I need to think about time. And then, when I think about how people use the product, well, I have to think about the quality criteria. Quality criteria like capability, reliability, usability, charisma, security, scalability, compatibility, performance, installability, and then development-related quality criteria like supportability, testability, maintainability, portability, and localizability. And then, I also have to think about the kinds of testing that I'm going to perform. I have to think about function testing, domain testing, stress testing, flow testing, scenario testing, claims testing, risk testing, user testing, and automated checking. And then I have to think about how I'm going to find problems in the product. I'm going to find problems using uh, feelings, emotions, confusion, frustration, annoyance, surprise, irritation, impatience. I need to think about the principle by which the product should operate, looking for patterns of consistency or inconsistency between the product and desirable stuff, like familiar problems. The product should be inconsistent with familiar problems, but it should be consistent with explainability, with the way things work in the world, with its history, with the image that the company wants to project, with claims that important people make about it, with comparable products, products like it in the space, with reasonable user desires. That's what those quality criteria are all about. The product should be consistent with itself. The product should be consistent with its purpose. The product should be, be consistent with laws and standards and statutes and regulations. And there's a variety of tools and artifacts, comparable products, output data that we can use in order to compare those things to. Probably pretty impressed with that, aren't you? I did that all from memory. Well, listen, you can do that too. And here's the reason it's important. When you can do this like a professional, when you can talk about your testing articulately, then the amateurs won't bother you. That's something that we've got to do as testers. We, I believe, have to start thinking like professionals. We have to start thinking like people who know what we're talking about because we actually do know what we're talking about. So here is where I'm going to go with this. 
The very last thing I'm going to say. Instead of verify that, try replacing that with challenge the belief that. At Pepsi's, we've got to challenge the product, not simply verify it. Instead of validate, let's replace validate with investigate. Instead of confirm that, let's falsify the hypothesis. Let's find problems with that. Instead of showing that it works, let's investigate how it might not work and discover that. Instead of pass versus fail, let's ask the question, is there a problem here? Instead of test cases, oh, can we stop talking about test cases? Please, testers, stop talking about test cases and start talking about test conditions. Start talking about test ideas. Start talking about product factors that we want to exercise or examine. But let's not reduce testing to procedural steps. Otherwise, people will think that it can be automated and they can't. Let's talk, stop talking about counting test cases and let's start talking about describing how we covered the product using rich models of coverage. Let's stop, about, stop talking about automated testing and start talking about programmed checking instead, a tactic by which we perform testing. Instead of talking about test automation, let's talk about using tools in powerful ways for far more than just checking. Instead of talking about use cases, well, you know what? Let's not, it's okay to talk about use cases. But let's also talk about misuse cases, abuse cases, obtuse cases, and abstruse cases. And let's not get too tight about use cases. Let's talk about loose cases as well. And instead of KPIs and K-locks, let's do the thing that we need to do in order to be more like the airline industry, which is why I want to go to Alex's talk. In the airline industry, they do something that we don't do enough in testing. We don't do enough in software development, and we must learn to do this. We must learn from every bug. Thanks very much. <laughs>